listening to someone who's just cursed you or whatever it is, normally that comes directly from your body. And that's why your body has to be retrained. And that's why Paul says, submit your body a living sacrifice. And by the way, all spiritual disciplines are bodily. The next element is the social relationship. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's your social relations. Inhabiting your social relations in a fallen world are primarily two things. Attack and rejection. Attack and distancing. And if you watch how social relationships go, you will see those fun, two fundamental modalities at work. Attack and distancing or rejection. That has to be redeemed so that love takes the place of distancing and attack. And then finally, the soul is that part of you that takes all of the elements of your experience and makes one life out of it. So now you've got a fundamental layer of the self that the scripture and poetry and in our ordinary way of talking often treats the soul in the second person as if it were another person. And so you have in the Psalms the re reference to why art thou cast down, O my soul? He's talking to it as if it were a separate thing. Your soul is not directly accessible to you. Your will is the executive center of the self. The soul is more like the computer that runs the whole operation and you don't want to hear from it. So if it's cast down, you've got a problem. And there you're apt to try to talk to it. And the wonderful Psalm, hope thou in God, addressed to the soul. And remedy comes from changing of the direction of your mind and that carries your emotions with it. Now, that's a little complicated perhaps, but we have to get that all out there in order to talk now about the role of scripture in spiritual formation. Once you have made the choice the decision to be transformed by the power of God, but by your action as well, then you have to decide where you can take a hold of the process. Take something as simple as God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That comes to your mind. Now you don't have to receive that. And many people who hear about it don't receive it, largely because their will is set in another direction. Now the Spirit of God and the power of the Word comes into the heart through the mind, and the heart has the choice of how to respond. If the heart responds, by trusting God in Christ, then there is a reconnection with God. Now then you have resources for spiritual transformation. You don't have that before. And now you have a choice of what you're going to do to carry through with the process of transformation. The miraculous events of conversion and birth from above are a special time in the life of anyone who has lived through it. To me, it's very vivid what the world looked like after I gave my life as a nine-year-old boy to Christ. It sure looked different. Even walking home from church that night, Sunday evening, Everything looked different. And thank God for that. 
But now then the question comes, where do I go from here? I can't just stay there. I have to grow. And that is where reaching out to the scripture, scripture reaching out to me, begins to transform my mind. Those around me, my ministers and my teachers and my parents, can bring before my mind the content of the Bible, and thank God they did. And it was extremely helpful. I still remember Sunday school with flannel graph. I love flannel graph. It's a warm medium. And also, you know, we children could move the camel around or put Peter over here in the boat or something of that sort. And uh, in this way, a simple Sunday school brought before me the contents of the Bible. And through them, the reality and nature of God and of human beings, both as lost and as saved and as in the process of growth. And in that way, the grip of a worldly vision which leaves out God, is ignorant of how he works, of what goes on in the human soul, the grip of that worldly view is broken. And now the will has a way of working. The soul can come back together. The wonderful Psalm 19 The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. And it works that way simply because if you walk in the law, then your world begins to come together in a coherent whole because you are now living from the kingdom of God. Now please don't don't say, but law is opposed to grace. Okay, It depends on how you use the law, whether or not it is opposed to grace. If you use it for self-justification, it is opposed to grace. But if you use it as God's expression of what is good and right, then it brings us ever more to Christ, not just because we're failures, but because it instructs us in terms of what is good and makes us turn to God. Anyone can find God just by trying to keep the Ten Commandments. If you try to do that, first of all, you're going to be in real trouble from the world around you. And you're going to need God's help to deal with that world. And of course, you're going to need God's help to do what the Ten Commandments say. But the law helps restore the soul. The Good Shepherd also restores the soul. He restores my soul He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The restoration of the soul helps the person begin to come back together. And it is the scripture that brings us, keeps before our mind what must be there if we are to surrender ourselves to God. Now that's one side of it. Now the other side of it I want to say something more about is that the word itself now is a power that enters us as we take it in. It isn't just that it stands before the mind, and standing before the mind gives us something to aim at. Rather, it becomes a powerful force in us. Jeremiah said, is not his word like fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock? Jeremiah 23, 29. See, that's a testimony of experience. That's not cheerleading. That's not Jeremiah saying, you know, jumping up and down and waving pom-poms and saying, oh, the word of God is powerful. That's a testimony of experience that Jeremiah had from working with the word of God. It is, Paul said, The gospel is the power of God to salvation in Romans 1.17. It is a power that entered us. When we take it in, 
it isn't just a matter of it being before our mind, but of it spreading throughout our whole personality. Paul says to Timothy, the scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. Now salvation is deliverance, scripturally. That's the generic meaning of salvation, it's deliverance. And when you take the word of God in, in the scripture, it is a power that works. Hebrews 4.12, you all know these verses. It is quick and powerful. Now to say it's quick, is not to say it's fast, but to say it's living. And that means it takes on a life of its own. And when you take it in, it begins a natural process of transformation. The wonderful statement of Jesus in John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it will be done unto you. Now that's one of those scary verses. You know, as you ask, what would that possibly mean? Well, among other things, it will mean you're going to ask for the things that God wants. Because the entry of his word into you changes your wants, changes your will. And so the power of God in the word of God, as we take it in, becomes a primary resource for the transformation of the mind. And we are, or the renewal of the mind, and then that leads to transformation. Now, we live in a world that is very much set against this. Uh, the teaching of the world about what is real, for example, is totally different from the teaching of the Word of God. It also now is true that the world does not want you to say, as a minister of the word, that you are conveying knowledge. They want to say that you're just doing faith. And the displacement of the teachings of the Christian church from the area of knowledge into the domain of faith has done and is doing undescribable harm. And every minister needs to check their attitude about what they're doing when they stand to present the scriptures and the content of the scriptures. And we need to ask ourselves, do I regard myself as conveying knowledge of reality? Or am I just trying to entice people to make a leap of faith? And you're in a world where your standing as a minister is called into question constantly on this very point. Do you bring knowledge? Knowledge of reality? Knowledge of human life? Is that what we have in Scripture? Or do we just have an old book full of fairy tales and teachings that people can leap towards but can never know? Now, just finally, if we're thinking about using the scripture as a means of transformation, we may need to rethink our services and what they mean. Are the services that we count as having gone to church, are they ones that effectively convey the scripture and its content into people's hearts, minds, souls, bodies, and their social relations? This is a question we have to deal with. Is it possible that the widespread conviction of a lack of transformation is due to a failure to apply the scriptures effectively to the lives of people? Having a high view of the nature of scripture is not enough to ensure that we are conveying the scripture and its content into the lives of our people. Do we have enough time in our services to do that? And given the time that we have, do we use it to honor the word? How much time is spent just reading the word 
in our congregations. And many of our churches.